Praise the Lord, everybody. You might want to turn me down just a little bit, if you don't mind. Will you stand with me? Let's just invite the Lord into this place this morning. Hallelujah, Lord. We lift you up. We invite you into this place this morning, God. We pray, Lord, that your will be done. We pray, God, that you touch and bless this word, every part of this service, God, from the beginning to the end, Lord. Every song, Lord, no matter what it is, God, we need your anointing. We need you to lead and guide us and direct us, God, in your word, Lord, that something will be said. We touch someone's heart this morning, that would change someone's life this morning. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name this morning that your will be done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. I'm excited this morning. I come across a new series called The Point of Low Points by Reverend Ken Gurley, and he's the pastor in Pearl, Texas, and uh, it's a very fascinating book, and I'm going to try to bring as much of it as I can. It's dealing with the life of Joseph, Brother Billy, and I probably won't even get into Joseph's life this morning because there's so much to try to lay groundwork for to actually get into have you ever heard anybody say, just hit the high points? Somebody's telling a story, somebody's explaining something to them, and they say, just, just hit the high points. That's, that's all I need to know about. I don't need to know about anything that went on in between. I just need to know the high points. I want you to get to the end of the story, so to speak. And it, it speaks of a desire to uh, eliminate the unavoid, un, unavoidable or the inconvenient or even uncomfortable things that fill in the blank between the highlights and the low points. Brother Shannon, I don't need to know the whole story. I just want you to get to the end of it and tell me the good part. But what makes the good part a lot of times is what happens in between. The things that you have to go through and the things that you have to face and the things that you have to deal with that, that get you to the high point in your life. Those things are important. Those things are something that we need to, to look at. And yes, we all, have, we all have low points in our life. And Sister Sherry, a low point simply is a valley that we go through. You see, men like to hit the high points. Women like to hit the high points. And when you study this, there are seven continents. And on those seven continents, there are seven summits. There are seven mountains that people like to climb. And they want to achieve greatness by climbing to the summit of Mount Everest or, or Kilimanjaro or these different mountains. And they want to achieve fame. But somewhere along the way, Brother Jerry, along that climb, there's valleys that they have to go through. There's death traps that they have to go through. But they, they, seek, they seek to find the high point. In life, they, they seek to find that adre adrenaline rush. And everybody here has had our low points in life. Some of us couldn't hide these low points even if we tried to. Some of us, we've seen each other go through and we've seen each other deal with them because life is as it is. And we have to face it and we have to go through it. A lot of times we have to go through it alone. A lot of times our families are, are with us. But we, we have to go through these low points. We have to go through these valley experiences that we go through in life. And there are times we wish that we could avoid them. There are times that we could wish we could avoid the low point. Because a lot of times, Sister Kim, the low points are brought on by ourselves. Our low points are brought on by the mistakes that we've made in life or the things that we have chosen to do or the decisions, Sister Judy, that I, I have made. That has placed me into a low point because of the things that I have done. And when these things happen in our life, when these things take place in our life, we can't help but wonder why. Anybody ever ask that question, why? Why have, I, why have I have to face this? Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to experience this? And Joseph's life, if we looked at Joseph's life, and we'll get into it, and like I said, I probably won't touch on it much today, but we get into Joseph's life, and it takes place in the book of Genesis, and he's been called the Jesus of the Old Testament, if you will. And in this Sunday morning series that I want to start for the next two or three weeks, I'll be going on vacation toward the end of the month, but I want to take a look at how Joseph helps us realize that even when we don't know why we go through the low points, we can know that there is a reason why. Even though we don't know why, we can know that there is a reason why that we are facing these things in our life. God knows the low points and he will help us through every valley, Brother Brandon, that we will ever go through, just like he did with Joseph. Even 
when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I can't see it, he's working in the background. Things are taking place that I can't even visibly see, but God is still in control even in the low points of our life. This sermon series is, a, is, is by Brother Ken Gurley, and it's called The Point of Low Points. And when, you, when, you, when you look at that and you, you think about that, a point is a purpose. A point is a step or a stage in development. So you're, you're, you're climbing, if you will, the point of low points. It's a purpose. It's a particular step or it's a change or it's a degree in development. And John 14 and 1 says, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. We know that the book of James tells us that our life is just like a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. It, we're not here very long. But the scripture says, and this is Job speaking, we understand the trials and the tribulations that he went through. He said that man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. We're going to go through some things in our life. We're going to experience some things in our life. We're going to face some stuff in our life. But I'm here to tell you that when you do, God is still on your side. God is still in control of the low points. God still sees us in every aspect of our life and what we're dealing with and what we're going through, he is still has his eyes on us because we're his children. Because he loves us, if you will. A mother struggles to give birth to a child, and a child struggles to be born. A fallen world welcomes a fallen man. Our days are few and often marked with troubles as the scripture relates to us. God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. Jesus Christ went through many things. He faced many things. The scripture even tells us that he was tempted in all points like as we are. Like we will face. Like we will go through yet without sin. Yes, he was humanity and yes, he was deity. But he suffered those same things that we're going to face in our life. He made a way of escape because he went through those same things. And he overcame, if you will. There was no sin and there was no guile found in him. He found a way to overcome them. Yes, I know that he was deity, but he was also humanity. He felt the same emotions that we felt. He feels the same desires that we feel. He went through everything, Sister Eloise, that we'll ever have to face in our life. And he made a way of escape through his life. Never. Never will we go without suffering. Never will we go out without pain in our life. Everybody at one point in your life will face that. Everybody at one time will face pain. You will face suffering. You will face loss. It's inevitable. It will happen. But know that God is still on our side. Matthew 5 and 45 says, He maketh the sun to rise on the good and on the evil, and he sendeth rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Nobody is exempt from the things that we go through. Nobody is exempt. You say, well, why does it happen to me? It happens on the good and it happens on the bad. It happens on the good and it happens to the evil, the just and the unjust. Just because we're living for God does not make us exempt this morning to have to deal with the low points in our life. Have you ever wondered why? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Why is there hurt? Why do we have to face it? Brother Gurley said that this is the Achilles heel of Christianity. And to look at that, you got to know who Achilles was. Achilles was a mythological character, a Greek hero in the Trojan War, if you will. Thought to have a miraculous power, the st sticks where he was dipped at. I I I'll explain it to you, but he was a mythological character whose mother tried to protect him from an inevitable, inevitable death. It was prophesied, Brother Billy, that he was going to die. And so his mom took him as an infant, Brother Ray, and she held him up by his heel, and she dipped him in what is known as the river Styx, where we start to have miraculous powers. It was also called Hades. It was the great underworld. The river forms a border between the underworld and the world of the living. The word means hate in Greek, 
and in the world of the living. The word means hate, and it's named after a goddess Styx. But as his mother dipped Achilles in the river Styx, Sister Kim, she missed a spot. The spot that she held on to him by his heel. Brother Shannon, she missed that. So you know what happens. If you know the story, he was out in battle, and there was an arrow shot. And guess where it hit him at? It hit him in the heel, in the one place that he wasn't protected. So we're going to face that in life the same way that he faced death. It was inevitable. It was prophesied that he was going to do it. I know this is a mythological character. But pain and suffering, listen to this now. Pain and suffering will either activate our faith or cause us to flee from God. I said pain and suffering will activate our faith in God or will it cause us to flee from God. When we go through these things, we ask the question, and, and our reasoning goes like this, well, if God loves me, then why has this happened to me? Anybody ever said that? If God loves me, then why does this happen to me? If God is good, then why do bad things happen to good people? Or even still, since God is all-powerful, why can't he take away the pain? Why can't he stop the pain? Why can't he stop the suffering that's going on in this world today? From our childhood, we're taught to pray that God is good. God is great. And because of that, Sister Margaret, he should step in and he should take away the pain. He should take away the suffering. And when he doesn't, Brother Billy, we're left with a question, why? Why do we have to go through these things? Why do we have to face these things in our life? The points of low points. Can you imagine how many questions God gets asked in a day's time? You stop and think about that. When we pray, we ask God, why? 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 Can you imagine how many questions he gets asked? Saul lifted up his eyes and he said, Who art thou, Lord? In Acts chapter 9, verse 5. And then he asked a second question. Lord, what will thou have me to do? What do you want me to do? What's your purpose in my life? What is your plan in my life? He was struck blind on the road to Damascus. He couldn't see. The powerful Saul was struck down to where he needed help to even regain his footing to be led into the city. But God had a plan for him. God had a place for him. We ask who, and we ask what, and we ask where, and when of God pretty frequently. But the most pervasive question and the painful question that we ask is why. Why does this have to, to happen? Christian author Lee Strobel had a national survey issued that posed this question. If you could ask God one thing, what would it be? Think about that. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? The most frequent, frequent response was, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much pain in the world? Brother Gurley said the why. Brother Billy is the fish hook. It penetrates. It goes deep. You ever got a fish hook in your finger? I'm sure some of you guys that have fished have got a fish hook in your finger. You've got a fish hook in your flesh. And he said it's a fish hook. It penetrates down deep in our soul. In every human heart, sickness, disappointment, abuse, betrayal, broken relationships, sorrow, accidents, and countless other troubles assail each of us. And we ask the question, why did this happen to me? We think we're special sometimes. You ever notice that? We think we're special sometimes. Why, why me? Why me when it's happening to other people? When it's happening to my friends and it's happening to my family? And we want to know why did it happen to me? We're not special. We're not particular. It's, it, it, it happens to the just and the unjust, if I, as I said. Helen Keller said character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened and ambition inspired and success achieved. I'm going to read that again. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened and ambition inspired and success achieved. Helen Keller was blind. She couldn't see. 
deaf, she couldn't hear, but she accomplished many, many things in life. She didn't let it stop her. She didn't let the question why slow her down. She didn't let it stop her. And she said it can't be developed in ease and quiet, made in his image. We want to understand the ways. We want to know that there's a reason behind what's happening to us at this moment. Life is more than fate or chance or the roll of a dice. We want to know that God has a plan for our life. We want to know that he has something in store for us. That he wants, to be, that he wants us to be so much more than what we really are. Psalm 77 and 19 in the NIV version said your path, and he's speaking to the children of Israel out of Egypt. He said your path led through the sea and your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. He brought them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. And we know the story that as they got across, the rivers closed back together and washed away the armies of the Egyptians. And it washed away their footprints, but they had to go through Brother Billy, they had to stand there at that Red Sea, not knowing what was going to happen to them. Can you imagine standing there that day, and there were possibly two to three million people? And God told them that you're going to have to go through the Red Sea. And we know that Moses spoke the words, and the sea parted, and they walked across, the Bible says, on dry land. That in itself is a miracle. That in itself is a miracle. But God made a way of escape. And it wasn't one that they could visibly see. That's, that's the way it is so, so many times in our life. God has a way for us to escape the pain and suffering, but a lot of times we don't see it. There's a lot of times that he will stop it from happening to us, but there's a lot of times that we have to go through that. But he led these people across the Red Sea. He told them that, he told them that their enemy would no longer be seen, that they were going to be gone that day. We might not necessarily need to know the reason why we must understand that present sufferings work toward further glories. There is a purpose in our pain. There is a purpose in our suffering. We know that God is good and his ways are good and that man's sin shattered that goodness. But through God's grace, his love and his fellowship was restored back to him. Suffering is not good. Suffering is not good, Brother Pete. We don't like the pain, but I believe God does his best work when we hurt the most. I didn't get too many amens out of that, but that's all right. But I believe God does his best work in us when we go through the pain because it's a growth process. It's a plan that he has for us. Paul said all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. In Romans 28. And surely when he said all things work together for good. All things include pain and it includes suffering that we go through. When you think about it like that. Behind each and every low point in our life is a loving God working his will. If you find yourself in a valley, it doesn't mean that you've made a wrong turn. It may mean that God has something more than you can see at that time. God shapes his best characters in valley experiences, in the valley of affliction. Moses, Abraham, Elijah, Job, David, Paul, Spencer Johnson, which is a medical doctor, said the path out of the valley appears when you choose to see things differently. When you, when you have a change of vision, when you have a, a change of direction that takes place in our mind, that's when the path appears. God told Israel, he said, I'm going to take you to the valley of Achor. And the valley of Achor means trouble. I'm going to take you to the valley of Achor. You're going to have to go there. You're going to be led through that. But I'm going to make it into a doorway of hope. I'm going to make it into a place of escape, if you will, in Hosea 2 and 15. God calls us to be fruitful. He wants us to be fruitful. One of the first things that he told uh, Adam in the, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He repeated it on the plants and the animals. He said, be fruitful and multiply. The scripture talks about 30 and 60 and 100 fold blessings. Wait those who will carry out his work no matter what the circumstances that they face in their life. We don't mind the water, but we do not like the pruning shears.
We don't mind the water, but we don't like the pruning shears. You know, I talked to you a couple weeks ago about the true vine. There's a process that's got to take place called pruning. And the reason it's pruned is so it will produce more fruit. So it will put forth more fruit. And that's the things that we go through in our life. Biosphere 2, Biosphere 2 was built in the hills of Tucson, Arizona. And it's still going on today. Scientists still have it running today and it, it was built in 1987 and inside of it it's it's a huge dome if you could see it it's it's a series of huge domes where they go in it's kind of like a greenhouse if you will and it's called biosphere 2 and they went in and they simulated five areas of our planet they planted a rainforest they planted an ocean with a coral reef there was wetlands there was grasslands and then there was a desert brother billy and the designers intended for this to be a prototype for humans to live and function in a hostile environment. If something happened to our earth, we can no longer live here. We could produce this, this, this colony, if you will, and possibly live on the moon or possibly live on, on Mars, if you will. It was a plan in case something happened to our planet. And I don't believe that will happen because God's still in control. But this was an experiment that they made. And over the next 20 years, the plants grew and the expectations run high. Everything really, really, really looked good. Yet, it fell short when it comes to the trees planted in the biosphere. The expectation was that the trees was going to grow tall and they were going to go straight and they were going to be majestic like some of the trees that we see today. Because they weren't have the hindrance of pestilence. They weren't going to have the hindrance of drought. They weren't going to have the hindrance of heat from the outside world. So they thought these trees was going to be beautiful growing within this biosphere. And instead of growing straight, and instead of growing tall, the trees grew bent. And they, they grew down toward the ground to where almost they were running parallel with the ground. If they did not have ropes and stuff tied to the tops of these trees, the trees would just collapse and fall to the ground. Because you see, it's the pounding of the wind that produces the strength of the tree. It's the pounding of the wind on the bark of the tree that makes it strong enough to stand. A tree without wind is hardly a tree at all. And I, th I thought that was so good. The, the wind causes the tree to grow deeper roots. As it's pushed against and as it's moved, the tree will grow deeper roots so that it's not going to be swayed, so that it's not going to be blowed over. And it didn't happen in the biosphere, but it's the same way in our life. What happens when the wind of trouble and the wind of pain and the wind of suffering blows against us? Either we're going to grow deeper roots. Listen to me this morning. Either we're going to grow deeper roots or it's going to blow us over. One of the two. Go ahead, Brother Billy. That's exactly right. That's a good point. Cotton loves heat. It strives in heat. And you think about that. We're either going to grow deeper roots or it's going to take us down. Charles Dickens, in his book called Great Expectations, said, Suffering has been stronger than all other teachings and has taught me to understand what your heart used to be. He said, I have been bent and I have been broken but I hope into a better shape. It formed him and made him into the person that he was. It seems to be a rule of life where life is the hardest, the strongest faith emerges. It is said the finest violins are made from trees that cling 
to the highest peaks where the winds are the most severe. The sweetest music may be found in trees that have been blown, that have been flourished with the wind. Faith flourishes in affliction, but becomes feeble and weak when there is no pressure. What's it going to take to make our faith grow? It's going to take adversity. It's going to take pain. It's going to take suffering to make our faith grow. I always said that when I studied faith and I taught about faith, faith is like a muscle. You've got to exercise it every day to make it grow. That's what faith is. To make it grow, you've got to exercise it every day. Brother Gurley said he took a trip to Seattle, Washington. And he came across an orchard, and he stopped there, and he went out into the orchard, and it looked like there was fence posts planted out there, Brother Pete. It looked just like it was fence posts fence post planted right out in the middle of this orchard, just row after row after row. And he became curious, and he stopped at a convenience store, and he went in, and he asked them, he said, what's planted in that vineyard out there? And they said, those are apple trees. And he said, you see, over a period of time, an apple tree will produce so much bark that it cannot produce fruit. So they take that tree and they severely prune it so that the tree itself thinks that it's dying. And only then will it begin to produce fruit again. And I'm thinking, wow, can we not apply that to our life? I talked to you about the true vine a while ago. We build up layer and we build up layer and layer of stuff. Stop and think about that. We build up so much stuff in our lives. We build up so much stuff in our hearts. We build up so much stuff in our, in our minds that there are times that we stop producing for God. Because of the cares of the world, because of the troubles of the world, because of what we're going through, because of what we're facing and what we're having to endure. And we build up these layers and layers and layers. And it's at that time that we need God to step in and begin to prune those things back out of our lives. Through prayer and through fasting, through an understanding of yourself. See, it's not going to happen until we realize that we need it to be done in our lives. He's not going to step in and do it until we ask him to. Until we come to the realization that, God, I need you. I've got to be pruned according to Matthew 5 and 2. That way I'll produce more fruit for you. i become more fruitful for you. Yes, sir. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. When even nature itself teaches us that pain and suffering will make us grow, that's amazing. That is the hand of God at work showing us a lesson. It's hindering our growth. But if we come through those things and we become strong like the tree, we'll be like Psalms 1 and 3 tells us. He says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not weather, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. You're going to grow. You're going to be like a beautiful tree. Through the journey of Joseph, we see there's a point in every low point of his life. By looking at Joseph's life, maybe our life will become clearer for us to understand. We may not arrive at a place where we welcome adversity. We might not like it, but we'll understand what Dottie Rambo wrote when she says, In the valley, he restoreth my soul. In the valley, things change. Why is Joseph so special? You look at Joseph's life and you begin to think about it and it all takes place within the book of Genesis. And there are two chapters and 66 verses that relate to us creation. Two chapters, 66 verses is all we have about the creation of our universe, about the creation of things, 
The opening two chapters of the Bible describes creation, earth, and all the living things, including Adam and Eve. A total of 66 verses. The Bible not, it does not tell us about dinosaurs. It doesn't relate to us about the Ice Age. It leaves a lot of questions unanswered that we have in our mind. Things that we studied in school. Two chapters, 66 verses is all there is. It simply states that in the beginning, God. And I've always said that if you cannot believe Genesis 1 and 1, then you don't have faith. Because Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Activates our faith from the very beginning. Two chapters, 66 verses to explain creation. And yet in the life of Joseph, there are 14 chapters and 448 verses that bring to us Joseph's life and his story. So Brother Shannon, that tells me there is something important to be learned within the life of Joseph. There's an emphasis that is placed on the life of Joseph by a margin of 7 to 1. God tells us that much more about Joseph than he did about creation. Seven to one, Joseph's life is emphasized more than creation itself. And with that being said, it simply cannot be ignored. The word seems to suggest to us that it's more important that we learn how to live than how we were created. It's more important for us to learn how to live and deal with adversity and deal with the suffering and deal with the pain than it is than how we were created. Brother Gurley said, origins are important, but character is essential. God's spoken word created the world, but only faith in God will transform our world. The Bible shows us, through Joseph, how to recreate our world when our lives have been shattered. I thought about that, and I began to, to look at that, and I began to think about our congregation, I began to think about our people. And I'm not calling anybody out, but we sit here among people that have been through some things in your life. You've dealt with some adversities in your life. But you know what? You're here this morning, and to me that speaks of your faith in God. That speaks to me that you're an overcomer, that you went through adversity, and yet you're still here. You did not let it break you. Yeah, you might have been bent, and you might have been bold, like the trees, but you're still here because of your faith in God. And God began to deal with me a little bit about that. And I began to think about that. You know, I've gone through a few things in my life, but I think about some of the things that you've been through. There's the loss of loved ones. There's a loss of a spouse. There's a loss of a kid. You've went through things. You've lost homes and you've lost family and, and different things. And I began to think about that. And I want to encourage someone this morning. I want you to listen to me right now. Write that down. Share it with somebody. Testify about it. Give God the glory for it because you're still here. Through all your sufferings, through all your losses, and loss clings to us like a smell sometimes. It's hard to get away from. But share that with somebody. I encourage you, if you've ever faced anything in your life, and I know some of you have because I've, I've seen your story unfold in front of me. I prayed prayers for you as you went through things in your life, as you had to endure things in your life, but you're still here this morning. You're still here this morning because of your faith. It's made you grown stronger. It's, it's, it's increased your faith in God. And you're still here for a purpose. You're still here for a plan. God is not finished with you. Matter of fact, in a lot of you, and I truly believe this, he's just now beginning a work in you. No matter what the age you are, God has a plan for you in your life. He has a purpose for you in your life. You went through those things, even though some of it might have been brought on by yourself, by your own mistakes, by your own decisions, but he still has a plan for you this morning. Share that with somebody. Help somebody with that. It speaks of your faith in God.
You're probably right, Brother Billy. And, and we, look at the, we look at Joseph's life. Like I said, I'm probably not even going to get into the beginning of it this morning. But you, what you've got to understand with Joseph is his dad actually started that when his dad, and I'll touch on it in just a little bit. When you think of the first low point in Joseph's life, he probably was four or five years old, and I'll just share this with you right now, but he was probably four or five years old, and his mother died. And can you imagine what trauma that caused on that young child? The first low point in his life was his mother died in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin, four or five years old. And no doubt, we, I'll tell you the story in just a minute, no doubt, Rachel doted on that boy. Rachel loved that boy. And I'll tell you the reason why, but his first low point in Joseph's life was when he was four or five and he lost his mother. That in itself was a tragedy. But you're right. If he'd have kept his mouth shut, but he wasn't a kid at that point. He was 17 years old. But his father had given him the coat of many colors. And he was immature. He had a lot, he had a lot to learn. If he'd have just kept his mouth shut, sure everything might have been all right. Joseph. Exactly. We bring, it, we bring a lot of it on ourselves by the decisions that we make, by the things that we say, by the things that we do. It, it affects us. It affects us long term. Like I said a while ago, loss clings to us. This stuff clings to us. But names in the Bible are important. And Joseph was Jacob and Rachel's first son. But he was also, also the 11th son born to Jacob. Jacob had already had 10 boys. He had already had 10 kids by his, Leah and the two handmaidens. Most of us know the story of Jacob. He checked Esau out of the birthright, and he fled to his uncle Laban's house. And he fell in love with his cousin Rachel. It was love at first sight. We know the story. I've taught on it before, told about it. And he told, he told Laban, he said, I'll tell you what I do. I work seven years for her hand, seven years, and I get her in marriage. And Laban said, oh, yeah, that'll work for me. And the Lord blessed him the whole time that he was there. In those seven years, Laban's herds increased and his things increased because of the blessings of Jacob. And at the end of the seven years, he thought he was going to get to marry Rachel. And old Laban deceived the deceiver. Old Laban tricked Jacob, known as the deceiver, known as a shyster. And he slipped Leah into the tent. And the marriage was consummated and he didn't even have any idea what took place until the next morning. He agreed, Brother Ray, to work seven more years for the hand of Rachel. He said, I'll, I'll work seven more years. I'll go ahead and work seven more years. And, and, and the time finally came. The Bible says that Rachel was barren, but Leah was loved. And she womb was opened up. And she had, these, she had these kids. She just produced kid after kid after kid. And poor old Rachel, Jacob's beloved, could not have babies. She was barren, the Bible says. And finally God opened her womb. And she had this young boy named Joseph. And Joseph's name means God will add. God will add. And he added a lot of stuff added to his life. There was a lot of things that he had to go through, a lot of things that he had to endure. But Rachel, she didn't live to see what would become of Joseph. She didn't see Joseph ascend to power in Egypt and become the saving force of his whole family, nor did she experience the many arrows and misfortunes that will befall her firstborn son that he had to go through and that he endured because she died in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. And she named him Benini, which means son of my sorrow. And Jacob later renamed him Benjamin, which means son of power. He changed the young man's name. John Ortberg asked an interesting question in an article. He said, don't waste a crisis. He asked his readers to imagine they were handed a script for their newborn's life. They could see in advance the struggles that the child would have to go through. They could see in advance the experiences that they would have to go through and endure, including lear learning disabilities in school, a loss of a friend to cancer, car accidents, depression, a loss of a job, and so much more. If you could see that, if you could take little Mac and you could see those things that were going to happen to him, what would you do? If you could erase every failure, if you could erase every disappointment and their suffering, would that be a good idea? Sure, you as a mother probably would think that. 
But would it really be a good idea? Probably not, Sister Judy, because that what makes us who we are and what we have to experience in life and what we have to go through in life and what we have to endure. Ortberg said, after all, God, listen to this, God isn't at work producing the circumstances that I want. God's not at work producing the circumstances that I want. God is at work in bad circumstances producing the me that he wants. I thought that was very powerful in itself. He's not producing the circumstances that I want or that I need in my life, but he is producing what he wants in me and the bad circumstances that I go through and the things that I face and the things that I have to endure. C.S. Lewis said, we were promised sufferings. They were a part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn, which is one of the Beatitudes. Rachel wasn't given a script to Joseph's life, and she did not have an eraser. She wouldn't have been able to predict all that Joseph would have to experience in life. If she could have, she would have used that eraser over and over and over again because of the things that her boy had to endure. But the low points of Joseph's life defined who he would become. It's in times of low points in his life that he held on to his identity of who he was. The low points in his life made him the man that he, that he was. He said what the enemy meant for bad, God meant it for good. Things happen for a purpose and things happen for a plan. Joseph, the old, the old Testament Jesus, if you will, their lives parallel each other. Both were born in supernatural circumstances and both were highly favored and both experienced rejection by their brothers. Both were sold for so many pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver and I believe Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. There's a lot of similarities. Uh, one, one, one scholar said there's at least 100 comparisons between the life of Jesus and the life of Joseph. So it tells us a lot about what's going to take place in Jesus' life. Not only that, but what's going to take place in our lives. Through Joseph, we get a glimpse of who Jesus was going to be and who he was to come. And as God did with Joseph, he's still doing with us today. He's still molding us and he's still making us today. People can and often do excuse their failures by claiming that Jesus was divine and that we are only human but you see, Joseph wasn't a god, but he was godly. Joseph wasn't a god, but he wasn't godly. He wasn't eternal, but he made his life count. He did not have supernatural powers, but with God's help, he triumphed, triumphed over all the adversities that he went through. If he made it through the low points of his life with flying colors, then I can believe that we can learn from Joseph's life and help us to go through some of the ups and downs that we go through and that we face in life. Brother Gurley said it like this. He said, God is more concerned that each generation see him than he is concerned with our convenience. Right. Right. Sister Kim? Uh, going back to Leah and Rachel, you kind of think, which you probably did from the start, because Leah was already angry. Leah was already cheated. Leah was already bitter. Exactly. So, And you could study, I did a study on that. You could take Leah's life. You could take her child's names that she named them. Each one meant a certain meaning until she got to a point to where she seen that no matter what she done, things weren't going to change. And she named that boy that she named him Judah, which means praise. She finally realized that she's going to praise God for the blessings that he had blessed her with. Things that she had to go through that, that, that was brought on, but that's a good point. It does. It does.
That's right. That's exactly right. When, you, when you're that witness and you help win that soul, when you, when you don't give up, no feeling like it, none, none whatsoever. And that's, that's what Ger, Brother Gurley's quote said. He said, God's more concerned that each generation, that the people around us see him than he's concerned with our convenience and how easy that we have it. It seems hard, but Paul said, I can do all things through Christ with strength. Man, we'll share this last point to you before we get ready to change the service. Uh, looking at Facebook yesterday, all you do that, so don't throw no stones at me. But Sister Laura Butler shared this quote on Facebook yesterday, and I thought, man, it's, that's tremendous. She said, just because the process hurts doesn't mean the results won't be beautiful. Just because the process hurts don't mean the results will not be beautiful. I begin to think about the potter in Jeremiah chapter 18. You see, it's the pressure of the hand of the potter that forms the vessel into what he wants it to be. Without that pressure on that piece of pottery, Brother Ray, it would come all to pieces. It's that pressure. It's that pressure that we have on our life where God's molding us and that God's making us. He forms that clay into the vessel that he wants. So we take it in our life that we go through these things and we go through this pain and the suffering, but it's the hand of the potter that's on our lives and he's molding us and he's shaping us and he's making us into what he wants us to be. The point of low points. Hopefully next week I'll get into the first part of Joseph's life and share with you some things that, that he went through. Adversity did not harden his character and prosperity did not ruin him. He was the same in private as he was in public, and he was a great man. When you study the life of Joseph, just had a graph up here. I found a graph, but it's just high point, it's a low point. It's a high point, and it's a low point until he finally achieves what God intended for him to do. And he's still working in our lives this morning. This lesson is to speak to you that he's still working in our lives this morning. Don't give up if you're going through some adversities, if you're going through pain and suffering. The potter has his hand on your life. I said the potter has his hand on your life. The offering plate is up front. If you need me to come get your offering, I will be glad to do that. Please make your way up front. If you have children in the back, if you will make your way over to get them, go ahead and do that and come on back. We've got about 10, 8, 9 minutes before we change services.